Hey, how's it going, family? The title of today's message will be The Coming Sixth Seal, Sudden Destruction and the Days of Noah and Lot. Now, the reason for this study is that in my recent time with the Lord, He revealed to me some things. He taught me some things concerning many things in the book of Revelation. But this is one of the aspects that, that I want to bring to you now, um, simply because of the fact that it concerns of a near future event. I'm not speaking about date setting here because there's no date setting that you will hear from me, but about something that will come to pass very soon and what you must expect and what you must um, be prepared to see when the sixth seal is released. And so let's take a look at Revelation chapter 6 verses 12 through 17. And this will be the focus, our scripture focus for uh, today's message. And it says, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal. And lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell onto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll, when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And it came to the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman. And every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rock, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand? And so the sixth seal will only be recognized by six specific signs. Right, so there'll be six signs that will accompany by the unleasing, the opening of the sixth seal. The first is a great earthquake. There shall be a great earthquake upon the earth. And many people has had visions and dreams concerning this earthquake. Uh, the next is the sun becoming black as sackcloth of hair. The third will be the moon becoming blood red. The fourth would be stars from heaven falling upon the earth. The fifth, the heaven rolling up as a scroll. And the sixth sign, as specifically stated, is that every mountain and island removed from its place. So it speaks specifically about the mountain and the island. This is pretty important for uh, later on as we will discuss. So these six signs must occur all within the opening of the sixth seal. If all these six signs are present, and I'm pretty sure that we won't be counting on a day that the sixth seal is <laughs> released, but these six signs is what we will, will be the after effect, will be the effect of the um, opening of the sixth seal. And so now the question that we have here is, is there an event upon the earth which can cause all six of these signs to occur at the same time? Um, and... As we proceed on to break down each one of these specific signs, when we go to verse 17 of Revelation 6, it says, For the great day of his wrath has come. So when it speaks about the great day of his wrath has come, this is the day of the Lord. This is the day when the Lord will begin to bring about the final chapter of man's history. And so beginning with the spiritual dynamic of the message, it says, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal. So this is the time when our Lord Jesus, who is in heaven, in a spiritual realm, opens the sixth seal. So this event occurs in the spiritual heavenly dimension. And when he does this, the opening of the sixth seal in a spiritual realm is manifested in in the natural realm through these six signs that we're talking about right now. And so looking at the first sign, it says, what causes earthquakes upon the earth? All right, so we already know the answer to this, right? Earthquakes are usually caused when you have a rock underground, which suddenly breaks along what we call the fault line. And so when this happened, it releases a lot of energy, which causes, you know, a seismic wave that makes the ground shake. That's the most basic principle behind what you know, causes an earthquake. Um, but in addition to that, what are some of the things that could tr that contributes to the earth shifting in that way? So we heard of things such as fracking and um, explosions, which is still part of fracking. Um, <laughs> you know, so many different concepts, uh, so many different ways that an earth can move contributing to an earthquake. But the one that I want to specifically focus on 
is a volcano, right? So the notes that I have here says most, most earthquakes directly beneath a volcano are caused by the movement of magma or, you know, the lava in the lava chamber. So the magma exerts pressure on the rocks until it cracks the rock. Then the magma squirts into the rock and starts building pressure again. And every time the rock cracks, it makes a, you know, small earthquake. These earthquakes are usually said to be too weak to be felt, but it can be detected if you use, you know, different um, sensitive instruments that a lot of uh, seismologists are using. And then the notes here says once the plumbing system of the volcano, right, that's the chamber, is open and magma is flowing through it, it constantly creates this, this earthquake wave known as a harmonic tremor. And so this harmonic tremor, though it can be recorded, is not normally felt. And this is why when it comes to a volcano cause, well, an earthquake that is caused by a volcano, um, if you feel anything, any tremor, it will last longer than just the movement, the movement of the tectonic plates that we see happening today. And so the earthquake stated in Revelation 6, however, is said to be a great earthquake that is coming. So even though these volcanoes, they said that um, volcanoes can sometimes cause a little rumble that you may feel if you ever lived in a volcano, volcanic um, prone area. Uh, this great earthquake is enough to where you will probably feel more than a tremor coming from these lava chambers. And that was the first sign. The second sign is... Um, in Revelation 6, it says, The sun became black as sackcloth of hair. Now, what causes a sun to become blackened? Like, what blackens the sun in the sky? And for quite some time, we've all believed it to be a solar eclipse, including me. I mean, why not? That is the most obvious answer, right? The solar, A solar eclipse in the sky where the moon blocks the sun, and so therefore the sun is darkened. This has to be that sign. But then... When the Lord began to speak to me about this, he gave me like a new perspective that I didn't consider. And so I had to look into this a little more to find out for myself because I was too quick to to accept the answer that someone else gave me instead of being a Berean and looking into, looking into the matter myself and see if there's anything that the Lord um, would rather give me a new perspective on. And so we already know about the solar eclipse, but then there's also black clouds. Right, black clouds has the potential to blacken the sun, darken the sun. So, what form? What two types of clouds that I want to mention here of dark color uh, will be the rain clouds. Right, we've seen that in the sky before. That you get a nice dark gray. Sometimes we may get that thick black cloud uh, that can block the sun. And then there is volcanic ash. Volcanic ash has the same possibility and ability to blacken the sun in the same way that a rain cloud can and even a solar eclipse level of darkening. And so the next thing I have to think about is sackcloth. Like, why a sackcloth? Why did John utilize the example of the sackcloth to compare to what kind of blackness he saw in the sky because you know in the scripture the only time the two words black sackcloth is used together like that is in the book of revelation but every other time it used the word sackcloth without referencing a color and so the fact that he says a black sackcloth which, which means that if you have the material of sackcloth and a color of black this is how he can compare the darkening of the sky too and so as you see the uh, pictures before you, the definition of the word sackcloth, by the way, is a very coarse, rough fabric woven with flax or hemp. And so looking at the pictures there, it doesn't show any definitive sign of a complete blackening of a material. What I mean by that is that if you take a flashlight and you hold up this sackcloth, you know, a sackcloth, and you point the flashlight at the sackcloth, you will see light coming from behind the sackcloth and so there'll be a darkening of the light yes but yet at the same time light will still be able to pass through nonetheless so when john was using black sackcloth as an example here he was pretty much stating that you know the the visibility of the light in this black sky was like having 
light trying to penetrate through a black sackcloth. Because if it was uh, a complete blackness of the sun, then he would just say that the sun became black, as it is mentioned in the other parts of scripture and other prophets who speak about the sun. But when he looked at it, he said it was like a sackcloth. So these are like the key words that I was never paying attention to, and I tossed it out the window thinking it was irrelevant, but there's a reason why he used that. And when I came to see this, I had to ask myself um, these basic questions like, well, a solar eclipse, when a moon gets in front of the sun and blocks out the sun, can sun penetrate through that moon? And obviously, the answer is no. But yet, if you have dark clouds in the sky, or even like volcanic ash clouds that's in the sky as well, and you have the sun, can light still pass through that cloud? And the answer is yes. So when I came to this conclusion, I'm like, wait a minute. So I have to change the way that I'm viewing, um, you know, the signs of God and like the representation and the expressions that John was trying to convey to us so we can have the most detailed understanding. Because if it was just a black sun, he would have said a black sun. But he made sure that he used sackcloth as a means to explain how he saw the sun. And now we are in sign number three. And the moon became as blood. And so the question, what can cause the moon to turn to blood? And there are, there are two answers here. The first is a total lunar eclipse, right? Or a lunar eclipse in general, where we already know the earth gets between the sun and the moon. And because of the way that the light is bent around the earth, it gives that, that red light penetration on the moon, which makes it you know red. We already know about this, right? We've been studying blood moons forever now, and we had this concept down packed. And so we ran with this to be the reason, um, to be the most probable sign in the sky for the sixth seal. But once again, the Lord had to deal with me. I was being very closed minded and narrow minded about this stuff. And I had to just really humble myself and allow the Lord to correct me. Because if there's one thing we don't like as Christians, right, regardless of who we are, is to be corrected on something that we are so sure of. Right. And I had to learn to put my pride away years ago, years ago, because it led nowhere and got me nowhere. And as a matter of fact, it hindered any of the work that the Lord wanted to do through me, especially in these days that are now upon us. And so looking at the second answer, right? The first answer was a lunar eclipse. And the second answer is, check it out, deep lunar eclipse. <laughs> no kidding, they call it a deep lunar eclipse. And so if you look at the, the news article that's right before you, it has the following to say. It says, Asian and African night owls were treated to a lunar eclipse. An ash in the atmosphere from a Chilean volcano turned it blood red for some viewers. And it says scientists said uh, the specific phenomenon happening Thursday known as a deep lunar eclipse often exudes a coppery color. But the intensity of the color depends on the amount of ash and dust in the atmosphere. Luckily for moon gazers, there, there was plenty of ash in the air, so the moon appeared orange or red, especially in Asia. Air travelers have been so lucky the ash has grounded hundreds of flights around the region. Scientists said the eclipse could be safely observed with the naked eye. So this is the second uh, of the, alter the alternative means in which a moon can turn to blood and as a matter of fact we had such case happen i believe on the border of uh, canada and i'm about to let you see the video clip on it right now of the moon being blood red with no scheduled uh lunar eclipse but because of a fire that was spewing smoke and ash into the sky so we're in sign number three and already we're looking at three signs that's telling us of a volcanic cat uh, cataclysmic event, a global event in which the volcanoes shall be the turnkey event that shall set everything into a motion, into, um, into motion, I'm sorry, <laughs> into motion when the Lord releases Bob the sixth seal. In, um, the breakabout 
what is making, if you happen to see the moon before the sun comes up and it was really kind of um, red, big. <laughs> It was, it was, it was he has the reason why. Good morning. It's like, oh no, do we have to start sacrifices? Is the zombie apocalypse coming? No, I'll tell you, we have a blood red moon right now across the southeast and mid south, too. Let me show you the reason why. Here's the map a satellite picture we took yesterday. It's a visible satellite. And you, I mean, that's what it's like. Let me show you what it looks like. We had the fires burning in Canada right now. That is a cloud cover. Look at the smoke all getting dragged down with the jet stream. That hazy stuff is smoke over Tennessee, northern Alabama, into Georgia. And that is what's making that moon look blood red. I mean, that's a cover right there. That's from Tennessee last night. It's a nice eye report picture right here. So that's the reason why nothing else. And so now another question that I present to you is, could this possibly be the red planets, the planet X, the Nibiru planet, um, planet that many people are speaking of? Because the moon, without the coverage of ash clouds, is its normal, you know, white, grayish, bluish, uh, yellowish, depending on the season, color. But in this news article, it said that it often exudes, exudes a coppery color. How many times have you heard that planet Nibiru has kind of like a copper, dusty um, texture, you know, like people who's in, who've been studying it and all this other stuff. It speaks about Nibiru having this coppery color. And then, have you ever looked in a sky before? And because of all of the chemtrails that's being spread across the sky, that you will see the sun in one location, but then the actual brightness that comes from the sun, like probably a few feet to the to any direction of it so you will look at it and you and because of the chemtrails you would think that there are two objects in the sky but what the chemtrails is doing is causing the lights to bend in, in such an angle that even though the sun we see the sun in one location the full brightness of it or the other aspects that makes the sun bright is shifted or refracted because of the bending of lights passing through uh, these chemtrails displaces it into a different direction and does not keep it on the sun itself. So could it be possible that during a, this volcanic eruption that would take place in the future, right? That the chemtrails that's in the air can mingle together with the ash clouds with, from these volcanoes. So that when you're looking at the moon in one place of the world, that you would see the moon in its regular color right but because of the bending of the light and where the ash clouds will actually settle in the sky that you will have a red version of the moon uh, like a um total lunar eclipse so therefore it will look like two objects in the sky and so we would call it a planetary object because many would say that it is this huge planet the size of Jupiter, right? And then in other, uh, other uh, researchers, they would tell you that it is actually probably the size of the moon itself or even smaller. So it could be possible that this whole concept of Nibiru and the planet X could be the opening of the sixth seal, which spews all this ash cloud into the sky and gives the illusion that there are two objects in the sky, but rather it's the bending of light because of all the stuff that's in the atmosphere. Something to think about, right? And so for the fourth sign, it says, and the stars of heaven fell onto the earth. So there are three ways we can uh, interpret this. The first is literal stars falling from the sky. The second, asteroids hitting the earth. Or third, hot molten rocks spewing from an exploding volcano, which is falling from the sky like stars slash asteroids, kind of like what we saw in the movie 2012. And when you look at the headlines for uh, uh, right there in front of you, it says horror moment volca uh, volcano rocks fall from the sky, injuring BBC crew and shock footage. So in Etna, there was an eruption that happened in Etna, which surprised them. And so what happened is that there was rocks that was spewing from the sky and landing uh, upon them, and it injured many of them. And then also in the next headline you see there, it says five, it says five climbers killed after a volcano spews rock and ash in the Philippines. And then going through the news article, the one that really stood out to me the most, it says, he said rocks as big as a living room came raining down, killing and injuring members of this group, some of whom were critical in critical condition.
So in this volcanic eruption that happened in the Philippines, uh, from their witness account, their eyewitness account of these rocks, they stated that it was the size of a living room. This here is just about the size of an asteroid and even, you know, bigger ones. So this is why I'm being led to believe that what John saw during um, this opening of the sixth seal was a complete, uh, complete volcanic eruption on a global scale that caused this major earthquake that occurred. So it seems like that the focus of the sixth seal is on a volcanic eruption. And so from this volcanic eruption, we get, we get this great global earthquake that they've been speaking of. The next sign that we'll speak about, the fifth sign, it says, Heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. And so one of the biggest things that many have spoken about is a upcoming pole shift that shall occur by one reason or another. Um, maybe an incoming planetary object or an overdue cycle or something like that. We've heard so many different things about it. Um, and it's okay if people want to believe it's a pole shift. I'm not going to judge anyone for doing it. No, that's that's not but the purpose of this study. And that's not what we're here to do. We're not here to debate and trying to call people out and say they're wrong. It's just that um, no one has ever seen a pole shift. So it's kind of hard to really validate if this would be a possible um, outcome of a pole shift that will cause the sky to roll up as a scroll. But based on um, human mankind's experiences, what we have noticed is that a volcanic eruption can also create the same kind of effect when you look at it. And so I have an example here for you, looking at Japan's Mount Ontake volcanic, uh, volcano eruption. And so before I play this video, the few things that you will immediately notice as you pay attention is that the sky is rolled up like a scroll as ash clouds move in in a rolling motion. So as the ash clouds from this erupting volcano begins to go up and fill the sky, you will see that it's doing a rolling motion as if it's rolling up the sky. And then you will, be, you will continue to see that the sun becomes as black as sackcloth, sackcloth because of the ashes. So when it says that the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, Look at how the volcanic eruption, how at one instant you see a clear sky and the very next you see the volcano, the volcanic ashes just rolling all through and pretty much rolling up the sky. And now we are at the last sign. And this is about the specific two items that was mentioned here. It says every mountain and every island were moved out of their places. So I say it again, this verse was very specific about, um, about the mountains and the islands. That was the focus. And so looking at this as the sixth sign, what we know is that many mountains and islands we see today were formed from volcanic eruptions, how they got that arc, that, that peak curve that you see at the very top of it. It was from many different volcanic eruptions. And we know that islands are formed Many islands are formed from volcanic eruptions. And as you see the pictures there, I gave there's like, you know, evidence of seeing, you know, what these would entail, what they look like. So we just looked at the six, the six signs of the sixth seal, and they're all speaking about the same thing. So the only event that can be that it can be in which the opening of the sixth seal would cause all of these six signs to be fulfilled is a global volcanic eruption. This is the sudden destruction. This is what we will see coming upon the earth in the opening of the sixth seal. It would not just be a regular earthquake. For we have for we understand that and it says in the scripture that you know there was an a great earthquake. But not only was there an earthquake, but there were five other signs that all shows that there is a connection to it when a volcano erupts. So can you imagine being in a world set on fire by volcanoes erupting probably within feet from you?
because lava will be spewing out of everywhere. The sixth seal is going to set the earth on fire. This is the moment a sunny Saturday morning on Mount Ontake suddenly turned deadly. The huge cloud of ash spewing from the mountain caught on camera by a Japanese documentary team. Further up the mountain, this hiker caught the full horror as it unfolded on his phone camera. This is really dangerous, he says. This is really bad. He scrambles downwards, hoping to get to a shelter. But in seconds, the ash cloud is over him. You can hear the tiny bits of rock raining down. It's little wonder many survivors say they were convinced they were going to die. It was terrifying, this man says. The rock was falling like hailstones. We covered our faces with anything we could find, but we still couldn't breathe or even open our eyes. <laughs> Meanwhile, on top of the mountain, these screams are from a group trapped inside a hut. Ash billows outside the window. You can hear the thump, thump of rocks falling on the roof. Morning revealed the extent of the destruction. The top of the mountain turned to a moonscape, buildings covered in a thick layer of ash. As rescuers finally arrived, they found at least 30 people lay dead in the ash field. The military managed to take some survivors off by helicopter. Others were carried on stretchers. This evening, Mount Ontake is continuing to pour ash and steam into the sky. The question now is why was there no warning? Rupert Wingfield Hayes, BBC News, in Tokyo. And with everything that we do, we always want to put the scripture on it. Because like I mentioned in past studies before, if I don't put scripture on the things that I'm sharing, then really it doesn't hold any weight. It doesn't really mean much because the scripture must be the final authority over everything that we speak in the name of Jesus. And so the part that we're going to look at here, I titled it the days of Noah. That's the subtitle here. And there are a few scriptures we're going to look at. The first is second Peter three. And it says, knowing this first that there shall come in the last days, scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant, of that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. So one of the key takeaways to get from this scripture is that in the same way that the Lord destroyed the world of old with flood waters, he is going to do the same thing, but this time it will be with fire. So we're going to see a repeat of the days of Noah. This is why the Lord says that as it was in the days of Noah, he warned the people, his people about this in the scripture. He told us as it was in the days of Noah. So therefore the end result of the days of Noah was a flood that destroyed all life upon the earth. But this time, the Lord will not use a flood, but he will use fire. And if you think about it, this represents the baptism of the earth. Because first, we are born again in water. 
and then we are baptized in the fire of the Holy Spirit. So this earth, this earth, as it went into corruption, needed to be remade. It needed to be born again. And so the earth and the days of old was born again with water. It underwent a water baptism in the same way in which we went or we underwent a water baptism. But now in the latter days, the earth will have to be born again, have to go through a baptism, a fire. I'll put it that way. So there was there is a fire baptism in which we received as it was on a day of Pentecost when the disciples were in the upper room. So this earth will also receive a baptism of fire to cleanse it of all the wickedness that is on it. Matthew 24, beginning in verse 37. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, and in our case before the fire, they were eating and drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood, and in our case would be the fire, came, and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken, and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken, and the other left. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. And in Luke 17, likewise also as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day he which shall be upon a housetop, and his stuff into the house, let him not come down to take it away. And he that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. Remember Lot's wife. Whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it, and whoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. I tell you, in that night there shall be two men in one bed. The one shall be taken, and the other shall be left. Two women shall be grinding together. The one shall be taken, and the other left. Two men shall be in the field. The one shall be taken, and the other left. So the Lord is telling us here that we are about to see the days of Noah fulfilled in its entirety as he bring about the water a fire, the liquid fire upon the earth. And it's that fire that shall cleanse this final age in preparation for the third beginning. Because you had the beginning in a garden. And then we messed that up. Right? We messed it up in a garden. And then man had to go and learn to live outside the garden and find a way back to the Lord. But the hearts of men were wicked. And so the Lord had to destroy that 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 time with with water. And so therefore there came the next wave, the second move, the second new beginning for mankind. And now man is once again going back to the same states that they were in as it was in the days of Noah. And now there'll be a cleansing of fire this time instead of water, and it shall usher in the millennial reign of Christ. And finally, brothers and sisters, I leave you with Joel 2, verse 30. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered for in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance as the Lord hath said and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Thank you all for listening and may God continue to keep you in these last days.